Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 362 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yeah. Something weird going on with me right there. We go. Uh, <laughs> and uh, today, um, recording day is. Did I say that already? Wednesday? I don't know. I'm sure. I'm sorry. I'm a little, I got distracted for a second. Today, recording day is Wednesday, April 17th, post budget day, 2024. And it's a nice day here at the Beaver Lodge. Not quite sure whether or not we're going to get cloud or sun, but it looks like there's a battle going on. <laughs> I'm your host, the Eager Beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A. And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. Um, today, we are going to be talking budget. So we hope that you are uh, excited for this. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss Fee Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. But before we do anything else, let's ask Mr. Grizzly, how is your mental health doing today, sir? Good morning, Mr. Beaver. Uh, mental health-wise, well, uh, I think I'm doing pretty good, honestly. I'm a, I'm a little groggy because <clears throat> I didn't mm. sleep well last night. Allergy season, uh, the pollen is just off the charts right now in this city like extremely high so it's you know you take the medication you do your best you can to get on through but um yeah physically not feeling great emotionally i'm feeling really good yeah. having a having a 80 pound love hound that i have to walk every morning at 6 a.m i think really does you know help because you oh yeah you have to get up you have to get out this 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 uh you have another being relying upon you i wanted to say human but she's not human <laughs> But I have a sentient being relying upon me to take her out, take her for a walk. So usually every morning from 6 to 6.30, I take her out and around. Some days I've woken up at 5 and been wide awake. My alarm goes off at 5, but I'm usually not awake until 6 because I, I'm just not a morning person. But if I wake up at 5 and I'm wide awake, I'll take her out at 5 for like an hour and come back in and get ready to do the show. So yeah, I did, I'd say I'm doing pretty good mental health-wise, honestly. Good, nice good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, from my end, I am doing really well. I had a bit of a weird day yesterday. Actually, it was uh, the most part often frustrating. Just things ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, didn't yeah. seem to go well. But uh, on the upside, uh, my because I know you're all waiting for the do -do 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 Eager Beaver Lodge curling report. Um, my men's team won last night. Uh, we were playing really well the first half. We were actually up by six, and then we did everything we could to try to give the game away, but we didn't. So <laughs> we had well, to the second. Good. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, we, we had a weird ice, actually. Apparently, the night before, somebody had fallen. Oh, and, uh, and kind of like this, and they were actually like on enough. the ice for about half an hour before they oh. actually like, got him up. So there was a, a dip in it. So mm -hmm. they tried to fix it, but it wasn't completely fixed. So we call that uh, dished. The ice is dished. So yeah. if you're curling from the sides, you had like wild curl would come in, and then if you were going down the middle, it would go straight. And I guess and I just and I kept up. 
it took me, my skip figured it out really quickly, but it took me a little while to figure it out. So anytime he was giving me like a takeout, like anywhere, somewhere in the middle, it would like, my rocks would just like flash right by them and go like, why the hell are they not curling? There's like five feet of curling, <laughs> but not there. <laughs> <That looks funny. laughs> so, uh, but we went, so, uh, for the first time in my, I do not know what's going on, but it's, I've been playing curling for 20 years. And for the first time in my life, I am in not one, but two club semifinals oh wow a division in doubles and b division men so you're, you're getting better as you get older getting better I, with age i guess so i'm like a fine wine well, <laughs> anyway yeah but it's, hey I, i'm having a banner year I, I i i i've never ever ever remotely had anywhere i've won one bond spiel in uh, 20 years you're and fine in wine. School, i'm old cheese Yep. <laughs> and in high school, you know, medals like for the city, but also B division, right? But that, mm. that's it. That's it. 20 year career. I've got seven trophies, maybe. <laughs> you know? wow. So, uh, and, and only one A division trophy. So, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not equipped to handle the success. Actually, I don't. I don't know what to, what to do with it. But I'm happy. However, uh, it's usually the situation, situation, though, you know that, yeah. right? Yeah. Most of us are, are not equipped to handle success. Yep. We, we, every single human being on earth learns how to fail at a very young age. Mm -hmm. First couple of steps fall flat in your face. There's your first failure. You've learned from that. Learning how to be successful is a whole different kettle of fish. Yeah, it's really weird. And especially at uh, sports, because uh, sometimes you're, like, you're in the exact same situation you've always been, but just because it counts more, all of a sudden your old body starts like shaking. And I was like, what the hell? <laughs> you, know where I learned that? you know where I learned that lesson from of all people in this world? Harvey Corman. Oh, okay. Well, it was right around the time that uh, Kurt Cobain left us that they were asking, you know, they were just asking people about it. And, and Harvey Corman, of all people, who said he liked Nirvana, he liked their music. I was like, Really? He said, you know, when I, when we first, when I first got famous, he says, cause I had, you know, failed and failed and failed and failed. And then Carol Burnett show hit. And all of a sudden I was this overnight sensation after, I don't know, 10 or 12 years or whatever it was. He says, I was equipped to handle failure. I was not equipped to handle success. Mm -hmm. He says, I was a raging alcoholic. I was a terrible human being because I didn't know how to deal with it. He says, so. What has happened to Kurt Cobain is sad, sad and tragic, and we're going to see it again and again and again until we can set up a system that will help support people for their success, which sounds like a strange thing to say. Mm -hmm. It sounds like we're going to coddle a millionaire. No, we're going to coddle a human being who needs help. Mm -hmm. And that was That's his so. whole take on it. Harvey Corman, of all people, wisdom of a comedian. Hey, there you go. Um, so uh, tonight, my curling season could extend or could be completely over because it seems that my doubles semifinals at 745, and because we won yesterday, my men's semifinals immediately after 920. Wow. <laughs> so wish me luck, kids. Now, the second most important news of the day. The budget. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, that the budget. The budget also nice. happened yesterday. <laughs> Narcissists are us. I'm sorry. <laughs> ah, it's just playing, kids. Um, the budget came down yesterday, and uh, we were having a little chat before uh, the show, and you told me that you hadn't seen anything, but that people told you you would love it, <laughs> and and it would what? Finish the Liberal Party. I'm like, yes, what? yes. How, if I'm going to love it, why would it finish them? I don't understand that. Yes, um, and I I, th I think the best reason is to say uh, is because. A lot of people are saying, oh my God, they've gone so far to the left. That's right. It's like, again, Wouldn't we have locking to... up bankers if that was the case, though. I mean, really? If, yeah. If they had gone extremely far to the left. Yeah. But I'm, how would I put it? Um, we have to remember the overall global context that the overall Overton window, at least on the political right, has been shifting so far right that the right has definitely abandoned the center or center right. Oh, completely. 
Yes. And everybody's saying, well, because liberals made a deal with the NDP, well, they've they've also abandoned the center and they've gone left. And it's like, eh, not so much. Um, Remember, this is the party that gave us EI, that gave us two weeks vacation, that gave us, uh, you know, the 40 hour work week. They were thought of as extremely left wing ideals back in 1968 when Pearson brought them in. Right. Yeah. And, and now it's, it's just work life balance. Right. Yes. So, so um, I, um, how would I put it? It's, it's an interesting budget because as we've been mentioning, it is very, very, very much clearly focused uh, on younger Canadians. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, a, they say the focus is on for people born between 1981 and 2012. It's the eighth budget of this government. And uh, the major focus of the government uh, of this budget, of course, is housing. Um, on uh, Power and Politics yesterday when they were doing the analysis, well, not necessarily Power Politics, but on CBC News when they were doing the, the budget special, uh, they did uh, a word count. You know, those things that they do, how many times does this word appear uh, in the the budget text and housing appeared over six hundred times. Oh wow! Which is in the, in the text of the budget and uh, and then uh, the word indigenous four hundred times and then you know a couple of other words. But uh, housing was by far, by far the most mentioned. Uh, so the core of it is a housing strategy that uh, they say is, uh, involves about twenty three billion dollars, which is eight billion dollars in spending and fifteen billion dollars in loans. Remember the loans part are the part that the government is going to get back probably with a little bit of interest. So it'll be revenue generating and somewhat. Of course, there's going to have to be some provisions for bad loans in case. Uh, but uh, when the conservatives are going to be screaming up and down that, yeah, my God, this is killing. There's a portion, there's a big portion of this that, that are loans. Um, I would like to, uh, Mr. Weasley, uh, get you to play the first clip I have. Uh, this one's from David Cochran, basically giving a sub from CBC News, giving the summary of what there is in uh, the housing uh, thing. I would present the one in the speech, uh, but often in the budget speech, there's, they just mention sort of like the overall thing and then give a little... Um, a little statistic or something, but the, he's actually uh, telling, uh, talking a little bit more about some of the programs. Okay, let's give it a go here. Let's change this up to this. Why is why? that's not? That's what I wanted. There we go. Here we go. Let's have a listen. And what the government has announced over the past number of years uh, on childcare, for example, it, it's the aspiration is one thing, the execution is another, and so much of it depends on work done at the provincial level, and it's a similar thing with housing, right? So much of that depends on provincial governments and municipal governments uh, approving things, and also the labor supply is going to be a considerable constraint on the construction. But we have some more details just on what, uh, how the, the big housing strategy sure. announced on Friday is going to roll out. And, and in, in particular, I just want to highlight what they've announced in terms of using uh, government-owned lands. They their plan is to unlock up to 50 percent of government office buildings over 10 years to turn it into housing. Yeah, I so didn't with, realize that it would include offices, not just right. a piece of land. It's a building that could be there already. Exactly. Yeah. So like some of the government buildings here in the downtown core, Doug Ford was here not that long ago with, 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 with the mayor of Ottawa saying it's time for people to come back to work to help the downtown core. Remote work is more of a reality for office jobs. You have surplus capacity, convert those into apartments. But also, if you've ever dreamed of living above a Canada Post, well, this government has a plan for you. Uh, you, you have the, the post office, you have the Department of yeah, National the Defense. Defense. They own property across Canada, a lot of which is underused. And they aren't just putting this out there as an idea. There are specific properties in this budget that they say could be turned into something. So in terms of national defense, the Amherst Armory in Amherst, Nova Scotia, the National Defense Medical Center here in Ottawa, these are being looked at as possible uh, housing developments. You know, if you live near the uh, the Hardin Street Canada Post in Fort McMurray, Alberta, that has been listed for sale. So there are properties here because the question has been, you have the ideas, you have the plan. How are you going to do it quickly enough that people can see progress? They've identified some inventory. They've, they've, they've mandated their departments to look at the land they own, the property they own, identify things that would be suitable for housing, and, and maybe get, be prepared to put it onto the market through some sort of arrangement, either through the lease that has been talked about or a flat-out sale, and have that confer, con converted into housing, some of which would have a component of affordability as a requirement of getting in there. But that could be done a lot faster than having to build a bunch of new things as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. conversions are tricky, and, and you know, and one of the big things too about this, Rosie, is like we, I know we've talked a lot about the federal government and the pressure they have on housing. 
rent control is provincial. Yes. So, you yes. know, there yes. is a so role for all right. of the yeah. premiers yeah. to yeah. play yeah. on that particular issue, not just the federal government. Okay, Dave. I like him so much. Yeah. <laughs> I like David Cochran. Yeah, he does good work. He, he, he does a little bit what we do sometimes. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Throw, throws that little extra bit, extra bit of information there. Um, so, yes, uh, when he's talking about that type of stuff, when he's talking about just, uh, building on surplus government lands because it's government lands, government can dictate a little bit the activity that's going on. So he can say, mm -hmm. you have to build some affordable. Now, the question is whether or not the government will sell those lands or lease them. It's probably a better idea to lease them yes. so that you get revenue and that you keep them so that you can do something else with them in the future should something happen, you know. Well, 60 years from now and we need it for different purposes and he mentioned no. uh, ndmc which is uh, was national defense medical center and it's near yes. uh, near chio in the general hospital it's basically the same campus if you will yeah for the most part giant piece of land big parking space uh it's eight or ten story building i can't remember i've done a ton of work there over the years and the building is uh, there was a small clinic i don't even think that's there anymore i think it's mostly office space and even that has been minimized with the move to um the former Remote Nortel working. site yeah so um, if they can't utilize the building they could utilize the building but they could also if, you know if they wanted to to gut it reno it and, and turn it into apartments they could certainly do that uh this, this, this asbestos abatement would need to take place i know there's a ton of asbestos in that building it was built in the 40s uh, post-war uh, but you have a ton of land around it where you could build six eight ten story buildings pretty quickly yep absolutely uh so uh the plan is to build about 3.87 million new homes you'll often hear about four million it's just about four million by 2031 uh, with loans uh to build 130,000 apartment units they will be scaling up modular housing so they'll be able to build housing year round and then uh, put uh, those units out there will be credit uh, for on-time rental payments uh, for people who pay rent so basically you're paying your rent on time will go towards your actual credit rating which will make it easier for you if you want to apply uh, to get a, a mortgage later on and you might even get one at a better rate with a better credit history um, they will also be extending the first time buyers uh, for first time buyers, extending the amortization period for mortgage to 30 years, uh, which in one way is not good because when you amortize longer, you end up paying more interest overall. Uh, but this could have the effect of reducing your monthly payments to something that's a little more manageable given how much they've gone up over the last little bit. Right. Uh, they will also create a tax free first home savings account. For some reason, I thought that already existed. So I don't know if it's a revamp of a, a project or uh, something that already had and i'm not quite sure how it's different from the regular tax-free savings account well this would be a tax-free home savings account so yes but they have to have it has to have some type of provision right the tax-free savings account you're allowed to put in a certain amount and whatever you yes. make on it you're not taxed so i mean i don't know what the additional provision is or because there has to be something different about it or else why wouldn't they just increase the amount you could put in your tax-free savings account and just mm -hmm. do it through that um They'll also have something that's called an enhanced home buyer's plan, which uh, wasn't really explained and haven't been able to look that up yet. Um, but the goal uh, with regard uh, to using government lands and buildings is to unlock up to 50% of government office buildings over 10 years in order to convert it to housing. So that's sort of like the, the big, big plans right there on uh, there. Well, and uh, in, when you consider that a lot of those buildings, uh, they, have, they have mandated federal government employees to go back to work. But you're yes. only going two to three days a week. So yes. you've got, you know, augmenting shifts of people. So literally the building is never more than like two thirds. Oh, if yeah. that. Two thirds. If that. If right. that. Right. So it's it's like, okay, well, let's just close this building, turn that into housing, move everybody over into this one. Yeah, absolutely. Um then they talked about child care a little bit. There will be one billion dollars for a child care expansion loan program. Um Minister Freeland uh, boasted that Canada has reached a record high for working age women's labor force participation due to that. So uh, when people talk about that uh, budgets will balance themselves type uh, pro, uh, quotes like this because they forget the rest of it. But when the prime minister says things like budgets will balance themselves, we're going to invest this money in child care. Mm -hmm. It's going to allow more women to participate in the labor force. Mm -hmm. Right now, record high participation. All of them make money. Guess what? You're taxed on your income. That goes back in. That ends up covering the cost of the childcare, and sometimes even more. The budget balanced itself. 
Yeah. <laughs> they always leave out the rest of the quote though, when they say that the yeah. budget will balance itself, how do budgets balance themselves? Well, actually, if you read what he actually wrote and or spoke, if you read the words he spoke, if you wrote the whole content, you know, anyway. Yeah. Uh, the next clip I want to show is the one that you have. Uh, this one doesn't really, um, it ties in to, because when they always talk about childcare, they'll always talk about women, even though childcare is for everyone. Uh, but they talk about women, uh, and they segued into a little something about, uh, a woman's right to choose uh -huh. while talking about pharmacare, because as you remember, the pharmacare announcement came out and they're going to be covering, um, uh, diabetes, uh, insulin and, uh, mm -hmm devices for uh that are needed to treat and manage your diabetes as well as long contraception. overdue long overdue yes. for both actually so and on the issue of contraception contraception uh minister freeland took a moment to uh slide a little something in okay let's have a look at this let me make sure i got full volume here as a woman as a mother and as Canada's finance minister and deputy prime minister, let me say clearly here today, this is an essential right our government will always protect. countries our friends our neighbors wow yeah keep it going keep it going okay oh did, did, uh, was that the the extent of the clip yeah you you gave me one one minute okay. of the clip okay keep it rolling no 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 that was it then sorry okay. i thought it was a little longer for some reason okay. um so yeah just um that little thing right mm -hmm. we will do that because we know very well that the conservative side is a uh, has the the uh, campaign for life or something like that on its yes, side. Campaign and, uh, life coalition. Yeah. Yes, campaign life coalition, and uh, they are really trying to take over party nominations. So, so I mean, we already have I think is over eighty conservatives out of the bunch that uh, mm -hmm. already uh, vote uh, on any private member's bill to uh, remove a woman's right to choose or restrict it or curtail it in some way. So um, that just that little mention there, very very important. Um, continuing on, uh, there's also going to be about $8 million uh, put in to create various job opportunities, uh, with regard, uh, to some, um, uh, other measures with regard to, uh, growth and productivity. Uh, they are going to create a new vehicle supply chain tax credit. Uh, so for all not just batteries, but for all stages of anything that will go into the supply chain for creating right. uh, electric electric vehicles, uh, that that will be there. Uh, so they're building on what they've done so far uh, to attract investment, increase productivity, and boost innovation. Uh, Canada says uh, apparently is the first country in the world that has a national AI strategy, and uh, they. I think they a few it. will follow suit quickly. Oh, yes. And then, of course, you know, they announced $2.4 billion for AI relative, uh, related things uh, during the pre-budget announcements. And mm -hmm. some of that will be go to uh, building data centers. And uh, there will also be an accelerated capital cost allowance to make things eligible for immediate write-offs to get people to invest more. Um, let's see what else they said. Uh, she also mentioned that in the first three quarters of 2023, Canada attracted the very highest per capita foreign direct investment in the G7 and third most in the world. So uh, when the conservatives are saying that everything's broken and we're being split into oblivion so much so that nobody will ever want to invest here, that's clearly not true. And it was <laughs> true after eight years of Justin Trudeau. Um, <laughs> I mean, come on, man. Um, they're also, uh, when they talk about growth and productivity, they got into education a little bit uh, with uh, saying that they will now have over $5 billion in funding for research and scholarships. I don't think it's $5 billion. That's new money, but topping it up to make it to $5 billion. Mm -hmm. They will increase, uh, renew the increase in Upfront Canada student grants and interest-free loans. They will increase the amount of financial aid students get for housing, and they will make it easier for mature students to go back to school. 
And I didn't know this because I somehow I missed this in last year's budget, but in last year's budget, uh, the government of Canada eliminated all interest on Canada student loans. Yes, not I sure whether that. or not the provinces followed suit. Probably not, but I, yes. I do remember that. Yeah. Last year, well, the budget they had last year was actually even a lot of conservative political pundits were complimenting the budget last year. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. They were coming out saying, this is actually good and they're paying down debt. So, you know. Yeah. And there's uh, $1 billion in student aid as well with regard to, uh, to all of that. Um, so, you know, good stuff here. Um, there will also be a carbon rebate for small and medium businesses. At the moment, individuals get uh, the Canada carbon rebate. Well, the government of Canada has been collecting uh, carbon fees from small and medium businesses since 2009. And uh, now it seems that there is a fund and uh, that will return about $2.5 billion to 600,000 small and medium businesses starting later this year. Uh, so uh, that's kind of a big deal uh let's see what else uh, and so i'm thinking that's most of the productivity and innovation stuff um now when they're talking about conservatives talking about uh the economy going to hell in a handbasket uh the day yesterday did not start very well for pierre Podiev because the inflation numbers came out and he kind of got handcuffed. Uh, the core inflation rate number, the overall headline number, went up by 0.1%. And, you know, well, the last time it went up by 0.1%, well, Pierre was all out there with his meme saying, look at what the liberals have done. Uh, problem is, is that there's the headline number and then there's inflation when you take out gas. Uh, well, gas went up 4.5% before the carbon fees because there's more strife in the world. Mm. There's war and stuff. And we're also doing the switch over from winter gas to summer gas. Right? Yeah. That's, that's uh, the, uh, it's the bean salad you eat at dinner at, uh, at on the patio in the summer. Oh no, you meant a different gas. <laughs> yes. Different kind of gas. <laughs> the three bean salad that you have on the patio, you know, in the summertime because it's hot out. So three bean salad. So that gives you a different type. Oh, yes. but you meant, you meant a fuel heating gas and natural. Like, okay. Once I ate beans and then I had gas. Uh, so. <laughs> beans, beans, the musical fruit. The more you eat, the, the more you toot. The more you toot. <laughs> the Daily Beaver Morning Show where you go for all your fart jokes. Yay. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, they are, um, uh, I, I forgot. Did I not? We were so, I, I knocked me off. Sorry, I didn't mean to do <laughs> so that. So I'm going to segue. Uh, yeah, sorry, inflation. Yes, the inflation number came out, uh, and without gas, it went down to 2.8. Mm -hmm. So uh, last last month it was 2.9, it was 2.8. The core inflation one was 2.8, went up to 2.9. But food inflation mm -hmm. is now at 1.8%. It is below the Bank of Canada target of 2%. It's good, though. That Let's is very, very see good. see if we can keep it that way for a little while. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, this is uh, very, very, very good stuff. So... Um, he was, uh, you know, definitely had the plan going, oh my God, look, they added to inflation already, inflation, blah, 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 blah. And turns out that the inflation numbers are really good. So good, in fact, that uh, pretty much everyone is saying that, yeah, that coupled with a little bit uh, of bump up in the uh, unemployment rate uh, a bit is pretty much going to seal the deal for a rate cut for the Bank of Canada probably in June. Mm. Don't take that to the bank yet because it's just speculation, but it seems so that these are the signs that the, that the bank was looking to see and uh, it will look uh, very good. So this will also have implications for the budget uh, when it comes to debt servicing and uh, we'll get to that. But uh, PP did not get the gift he wanted and uh, everybody was quite, 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 quite happy uh, with uh, the fact that the, uh, those inflation numbers uh, came out uh, the way that they did. So that was the overall context for the budget during the day. Um, did you see Sean Frazier roast him? Yes, I did. And hopefully we'll have time to show that one because, oh my God, that was so good. Um, so we're going to play this next clip here, uh, Mr. Grizzly. And, uh, this is, hold on. What am I looking at this? 
Uh, oh no no sorry 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 I actually time stamp? I give I think I gave you I gave you the right timestamp but I think I may have given you the wrong video. Oh well that's not uh, it's uh, the first video that we you used. Okay with, with David, Cochran. David Cochran. I think yeah that's I think that's it. Yeah David Cochran. Okay just give me a second. I got it queued up. Ready to go. Hold on wait. I've got weird times here. Well I'm... sorry you did have it right. You did it right. I'm so sorry. Okay. Well, the funny thing is, they both queue up to almost the same thing. So anyway, I'll, yeah. I'll air this one, and we'll go from there. How's that sound? Okay. Let's just let's just sit back, relax, and watch. Um, how much time have we got here? We've got about two minutes of Christian Freeland waxing poetically about the budget. There are those who claim that the only good thing government can do when it comes to economic growth is to get out of the way. That's why you sit there, guys. That's why they sit there. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would like to introduce those people, those people who just cheered, to the town engineers who last Thursday made the final weld. It's known as the Golden Weld on a great national project, the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Yep. <laughs> and last week, the Bank of Canada estimated that this project alone will add one quarter of a percentage point to Canada's wow. GDP. Wow. All right, let's stop that there. I guess, and I'll leave it there because we'll continue after that. So uh, TMX is built. And uh, when she says the golden weld, uh, that's a reference back to the golden spike. Right, yes. When we did uh, the National Railroad, the last spike that went in. Um, so again, uh, another little um, uh, oh, yeah, a little <laughs> stick dig. a knife in and dig. All right. Now. When we, we get, get out of the way and they all cheer, and then she says, here's what we did instead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. So, and uh, that was the most animated that the conservatives got during the whole budget in terms of heckling, because boy, boy, boy we we can't cer certainly let a, a liberal get out in one full sentence without being interrupted. That uh, they did what Harper couldn't. Yeah, <laughs> just the thing. Yeah, just the thing. Um, now, uh, I just wanted to ask you: Is the one the the video that you have here the one with the uh, from a uh, CBC or just uh, just the full speech? I've got both videos. I've got the one you... No, but uh, which one is up right now? Which one? Oh, the CBC playing? one. I was just going to continue from where we left off. No, okay. No, yeah. sorry, that's the full speech. No, that's okay, the speech. So, okay, if it's the full speech, then just continue because yeah, now we're talking speech. about um, with regard to uh, keeping uh, the economic position uh, safe. So this is very important information because this counters all the BS you're going to be hearing until the election okay. about the econ uh, how Canada is being managed. younger generations and those who love them, we continue to stick to a responsible fiscal plan. As part of that plan, in the fall, we set three very specific fiscal guideposts, maintaining the 2023-24 deficit at or below $40.1 billion lowering the debt to gdp ratio in 2024-25 relative to the 2023 fall economic statement and keeping it on a declining track thereafter 
and maintaining a declining deficit to GDP ratio in 2024-25 and keeping deficits below 1% of GDP in 2026-27 and future years. Mr. Speaker, in this budget, every single one of these objectives is being met. As is our fiscal anchor, a declining federal debt to GDP ratio over the medium term. In fact, Canada has the lowest deficit and net debt to GDP ratios in the G7, as recognized in our AAA credit reading. Yeah. And private sector forecasters are now predicting a soft landing for the Canadian economy, thus avoiding the recession and heartbreaking surge in unemployment that many had thought was inevitable. Canadians know how important it is to responsibly manage a budget in the face of rising costs. And they rightly expect their government to do the same. That's why, going forward, federal public service organizations will be required to cover a portion of increased operating costs through their existing resources. Most of these savings will be achieved through natural attrition in the federal public service. As a result, over the next four years, we expect the ranks of the public service to decline by approximately 5,000 full-time equivalent positions. All right, and leave that there because the next clip will take on. We'll we'll continue from there, Mr. Grizzly. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you have to go get a cup of coffee, so I, I can uh, uh, expand on that while you do. I'll be right back. Um, so when she's talking about uh, the deficit uh, guidepost uh, to not have recorded deficit more than forty point one billion dollars, that's uh, something that uh, she had stated in uh, the fall economic update. A lot of people thought that the liberals would not be able to live up to that. Oh, they have. They're presenting uh, something that uh, a budget that will uh, announce a forty billion dollar deficit for this year, and essentially, for all intents and purposes, it's forty billion dollar deficits for the next three years: thirty nine point eight uh, the next year, thirty eight point nine the following year going down to 30.8 in 2026, 2027, 26.8 in 2027, 2028, and cutting it in half by 2028, 2029 to $20 billion. Now, as we mentioned yesterday on the show, however, there's a chance that some of this might go a little quickly, more quickly because of the good inflation data and the jobs data put together. If the Bank of Canada starts lowering interest rates, that is going to lower debt servicing charges and that would be very important. It would allow, uh, give the government more legal room, wiggle room uh, in case an emergency happens, or it would allow them to uh, get, uh, meet their target of reducing, uh, getting to 20, uh, sorry, cutting the deficit in half uh, earlier or faster. Uh, so, um, and uh, with regards to the, the budget, one of the highlights is that uh, the costs uh, for uh, servicing the debt have gone up, obviously, with all the interest rate increases. And they've even gone up a little bit since the fall economic statement, um, just a little bit. Uh, but we are spending uh, pretty much now about 10 cents on every dollar on uh, debt servicing charges at the moment. So we're paying it down slowly but surely. Yes, we're paying it down slowly. I don't see this is the thing. I don't know if we are paying down or if we're just covering interest and, mm. and leaving it okay. uh, at, at the moment. So that's I'm not sure if any debt is being paid down, but at least to service uh, the debt. That's uh, that's where we're going right now. About uh, like I said, ten cents of every dollar is going to service the debt. Uh, the government uh, will be uh, like. Pre-pandemic, we were spending about $30 billion a year to service the debt. Now it's about $64 billion. Uh, now, one of the things that you will hear often, you will see this meme going around with a, a graph that says, like, all prime ministers combined, Trudeau, how much they've added to the debt because mm -hmm. Trudeau has had to add over $600 million, a billion dollars to the debt. Um, thing is, is that 
while every prime minister in Canada has had some type of challenge, right? It hasn't been this since the days of Robert Borden, but the yes. prime minister had to deal with a global pandemic. And I'm pretty sure that, you know, given that people travel more and we are more interconnected now that it was, you know, this one was probably tougher. So uh, no previous day, we didn't have jet aircraft that could take us anywhere on the planet within a few hours. Right? Yes. So, um, every, uh, how, how would you put it? Metric. The, 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 yeah, every metric, by every metric, the current prime minister had a much tougher mm -hmm. job with regard to this. And in regards, you know, we'll talk about Stephen Harper, you know, because when I mentioned that, the 2008, that tweet I put out and said, yeah, and I said, yeah, the 2008 uh, crash, but the fact that Harper, Mulroney, and Harris in my lifetime, uh, you know, as conservative leaders have uh, left me with tons of debt because that's the whole conservative thing. You're, 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 you're kneecapping our, our future generations with this debt. And then um, selling off all of our crown corps for pennies on the dollar, exactly. selling off GM stock at a loss, selling off Air Canada, which that's improved the, ugh. right. So, um, so all this, uh, all this stuff is going on. So there's, sir, they took on debt, um, but none of these prime ministers had the world economy shut down for the better part of three years. No, none of these prime ministers had to completely switch the economic system in order to get money out as fast as possible to keep the citizens both alive and whole. Yes. Right. This was unprecedented. It's, this was new territory. Exactly. Nobody had ever dealt with this. Exactly. And conservatives never argued the counterfactual. Had we done nothing and everybody had lost their homes or their apartments and people were playing musical chairs in apartments and what, like, what impact would have that had on the economy? So, you know, they, would have crashed the global economy yes. completely. The other thing that Canadians need to consider, and David Cochran did mention this, is that uh, during that time, the federal government took on debt that rightfully would have gone to the provinces. Mm -hmm because the federal government has a better interest rate because it has a better credit rating. So the federal government, like they took on debt for us so that we wouldn't lose our homes and whatnot, right. Serbs and all that kind of stuff, they took on that debt because again, a federal government lasts, is intended to last until eternity. So they've got forever to pay it off, whereas we don't. So well, it's, it's instead not the of settling the country's last. The, yes. Yes. The government of Canada, the Canada's right. debt. So, rather than having us take out a whole bunch of loans so that we could pay our mortgages and whatnot while we're gone saying, oh, you know what? Banks allow people to borrow more and we'll fix it out later. And then you had all that debt with interest. The government took on that debt. Well, government took on, federal government took on debt for us, but the federal government also took on debt for the provinces. Mm -hmm. So when people are pointing to Trudeau like this, that's because there's a huge chunk of that 600 billion that would have been spread out over 10 provinces and three territories. But since there, since Ontario, for example, is already the most indebted subnational government on the planet, mm -hmm. probably wouldn't have been that great for 16 million Ontarians had they had to take on all that debt on the provincial books. Well, and yeah, for the provincial credit rating. So a lot of these things are a little disingenuous. And finally, when you're looking at the graph of all the other prime ministers combined, none of their data none of their individual data has been adjusted for inflation. They're just looking at the raw number. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's compare exactly. an apple to an apple and not an yeah. apple to an orange. Exactly. And then it's different. It's exactly. very different. So but, just, and, the, and people it's, you know, even like I do have, as you know, in my Scotch and cigar club, progressive conservative friends who completely agreed with what the prime minister did at the start of the pandemic. They completely agreed with it. They're like, we have to save people's lives. Move fast and break things. You have to in a situation like this. That's what was done. They said, look, we know people are going to scam. We know it. But you got to save people's lives. That's first and foremost your most important job. We know we're going to have issues later. We're going to find out about fraud. But look, we can save everybody or save nobody. And if you save nobody, nobody cheats. But guess what? People die. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And that's great for the economy. Yeah. And productivity. Oh, I guess. we don't have well, enough human capital anymore because well, that's what they like to say, right? Well, also, right, it's not a great, you know, you let people die. Okay? Yeah. Say you're an average 27-year-old. Yeah. How much money did you put in healthcare all their life while they were, they were a child? How much did you put into childcare? How much did you put into public education? Primary, secondary, post-secondary. 
Yes, they're 27. They graduated from their, their bachelor's degree. They are like a sort of college or trade school, and they're like in the first two or three years of their, you know, working life, and then mm. boom, out. That's all the investment we put in that person. Yeah. Gone. 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 Or you can choose to keep that person alive. Not a difficult Give them 2000 a month for two years to keep them alive, to keep all that investment we put in them. Because, and this is like, see, this is me speaking like a conservative now. Human capital. We mm -hmm. invested in that human capital. This is our investment. Let's protect our investment. And this is why I don't understand why conservatives don't get, don't seem to get this. Well, let people starve, let them lose their homes. That's like this. You just blew all the money you put into them all your life. Yeah. If you're talking about fiscal responsibility, it costs way more to keep, way less to keep someone whole. Yes, because for a year or two, so that they in. can live then from 27 to a uh, normal life expectancy, contributing to taxes throughout their entire life, contributing to the economy in their entire life, getting promotions, bigger earning potential, contributing more to the really, you know. So you don't, if you want to be strictly capitalist and look at people strictly as human capital, it's a really dumb move to let people flounder. After you've put all that money into them to build them up to where they are. Real dumb. Comment uh, from Kyle, our friend, Super Kyle. 2000? Yes. Yeah, Ford gives me 1300 Yeah, I know. It's pathetic, brother. It's pathetic, and it needs... And I thought the, this budget was going to deal with... It didn't. Yep. It didn't. Yep. Uh, there was uh, the... We talked about uh, the disability tax credit. Uh, that was part of it as well. Uh, that is extremely 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 disappointing uh there's mm -hmm. uh it's six billion dollars over six years so it's basically one billion dollar a year um the ask was about 10 billion dollars a year so they're a little shy um the money they're going to be funding it starting this year putting money in the fund so that you know it starts to build up and mm -hmm. you know gain some interest but payments won't start until july 2025 that's... The people and the payments will be two hundred dollars a month. It's over a year away. Yeah, it's over a year away, and now it's like two hundred dollars a month, so it's two thousand four hundred dollars a year. Now, people are not expecting the disabled community to live on two thousand four hundred dollars a year. This is a top up to programs that already exist and whatnot. It's but not the federal enough, government, it, it's not enough. But the federal government, um, it seems that with their negotiations with the provinces up until now, it seems it was made very clear to them that if they made the amount minimally attractive in any type of way, that the premiers would swoop in or were not going to guarantee to leave it to people. So they tried to pick an amount that hopefully would be helpful, but would it entice premiers to try and take it away from people? Um, that's their story. Anyway. And they're sticking to it. Uh, to get people to a living standard, the funding needed to be 10 to $12 million, billion every year. We've got $1 billion a year rising to $1.4 billion at the end of this five-year cycle. So uh, I don't know, man. I, you know, after talking this up and all the time that it took to get there and all the time, and I understand it's a fund and you got to put money in it and fund it and all that kind of stuff. But, this amount, two hundred dollars, is so such a pittance that if a premier anywhere touches it, that would probably be the end of their career, hopefully. Uh, but it is not enough. It's not enough. I mean, I just look at my own mortgage fees. It's like that wouldn't even cover the increase of my mortgage fee. Like it's it's not enough. It's not enough. It needed to be about a thousand per month, not two hundred. So I'm not, uh, yeah, Kit Vim, disabled, right to meet with your MP, because this is not, uh, Damn now at least, at least there's a structure there and maybe, you know, hopefully, let's say, um, if debt servicing charges are down a little bit, uh, the federal government would be able to take a little bit of that money and uh, say, you know, we're going to top up the disability fund, because uh, now there is at least something that exists to top up, but this is not... Yeah, as Carol says, Kit Carol says, it's a start. At least it's implemented. Yes, hopefully. 
So yeah, and Kit Kyle, uh, Kit Super Kyle calls seven fifty an hour of calculated and a full works week pay for the month. Which again, so, uh, there is no excuse for any person to no. not be making at least minimum wage if you are receiving supports or if you're working. Um, because and the reason I'm mentioning this is because I saw an article the other day about uh, people with developmental disabilities were getting like paid two fifty an hour for doing work. It's like pay them a goddamn minimum wage. It's yeah. work. Yeah. Work is work is work. Well, and disability Jeez. works at the seven fifty an hour, which I think is what the minimum wage is in the in, in most states. The minimum wage in Ontario is sixteen fifty now, isn't it? And that's not even a livable wage, by the way. Yeah, it's not even close to livable wage. Um. The big measure uh, was, of course, a boost in the capital, having to do with capital gains. The federal government had to raise mm. a little bit more money uh, to be able to cover that to meet the goal of not putting the deficit uh, over uh, fifty a billion, over forty billion dollars. Uh, now, uh, the federal government's uh, economic performance has been better over the last year, so the federal government did bring in seven point seven billion dollars in income tax and various taxes from uh, economic growth that they weren't expecting when they made uh, the statement. They have taken that money and they have reinvested that already. Uh, and then they've raised about $19 billion through doing this change through capital gains, which they've also already uh, they've included in this, uh, the spending for this time around. So uh, the capital gains, uh, a lot of people are confused about this. It's not an increase in the amount of the capital gains. It's an increase in the inclusion. So right now, if you sell something, you get a capital gains. 50% of it is yours, mm -hmm. and 50% of the amount you have to declare on your taxes, and there's a capital gains charge on that. That is going to increase from 50% to 66%, so from one-half to two-thirds. All right. Uh, now, this, uh, as we mentioned on the show, we probably thought it probably wouldn't affect people that were not making a lot of money, and it's true. Uh, it only applies after the first two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in capital gains that you make annually. So, this is something that will affect zero point one three percent of Canadians. Forty thousand of the richest Canadians with an average income of one point four million dollars, as well as the three hundred thousand largest corporations, companies, and trusts, um, is expected to generate nineteen point three billion dollars. And uh, the Minister Freeland had said uh, when she was uh, in, uh, when she was delivering the speech today, it is possible for a nurse or a carpenter to pay tax at a higher marginal rate than a multimillionaire. That's not fair. That yeah. must change, and it will. Good. It's look, we've been calling for that, I think collectively as a nation for what, the last twenty years? I, I mean, come on. It's it's wrong that at a marginal rate I'll pay higher than somebody who's worth ten, one hundred times what I'm worth. You know? It's just wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It's it wrong. Is. It, it absolutely is. Uh and I wish I could find uh the the, the tweet from uh, Kit Hugh, who actually uh, put uh, something, oh, there we go. In Canada, the top income tax rate in 1955, a time of unprecedented popular wealth generation prosperity for all, was 91%. So, wow. you know, uh, I think uh, they will be able to take an inclusion rate uh, that's a little bit higher, that, that will be able to, uh, you know, to stand now, uh, of course, a lot of people are wondering specifically uh, with regard to your house. Your principal residence is exempt, right? Right, and people say, "Well, what about if someone dies?" It's on disposition. So when someone dies, it goes to the estate. There's no capital gains on the estate. Once you inherit it, it's yours. If once you inherit it, you sell it, then. You'll get the capital gains, but there will be no capital gains on transfers from inheritance as well. Inherent inheritance and estate law is different. Mm -hmm. So oh, yes. just uh, for people to know. And then there's a couple of other things uh, that are also uh, excluded uh, from uh, that uh, rate as well. That uh, unfortunately uh, I did not note specifically up to the top of my head, but we'll be talking more about the budget in a couple of days, and uh, I'll be able to mention what the other exclusions are. But there are certain things that are indeed uh, excluded from that. But 
more people, more organizations, businesses will be uh, taken in there on that one, and that's going to raise some money and will cover for things. I got to help pay, pay for certain things. Um, now, the best part of the budget clip uh, of the the budget uh, is how uh, Minister Freeland ended it. So, Mr. Grizzly, if you are uh, if you have the full speech up, if you go to thirty one thirty eight. Um, and this will probably be the last little bit that we're able to do on the show before we have to close. Um, this is, uh, every now and then some people, you, you hear a bit of a speech and you think, okay, that was pretty good. This one, uh, if this is going to be the, the election platform or the election pitch, the stump speech for the next year and a half, mm -hmm. uh, this is pretty good. Game okay. on. Yet, I know, there will be many voices raised in protest. No one likes paying more tax, even, or perhaps particularly, those who can afford it the most. But before they complain too bitterly, I'd like to ask Canada's 1%, Canada's 0.1%, to consider this. What kind of country do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a country where you can tell the size of someone's paycheck by their smile? Do you want to live in a country where kids go to school hungry? Do you want to live in a country where a teenage girl gets pregnant because she doesn't have the money to buy birth control? Do you want to live in a country where the only young Canadians who can buy their own homes are those with parents who can help with the down payment? Do you want to live in a country where we make the investments we need in health care, in housing, in old age pensions, but we lack the political will to pay for them and choose instead to pass a ballooning debt on to our children? Do you want to live in a country where those at the very top live lives of luxury, but must do so in gated communities behind ever higher fences using private health care and private planes because the public sphere is so degraded and the wrath of the vast majority of their less privileged compatriots burns so hot. Every one of us here in this chamber today and every Canadian across our truly great country needs to ask themselves these same questions because the stakes could not be higher. Democracy is not inevitable. It has succeeded and succeeds because it has delivered a good life for the middle class. When liberal democracy fails to deliver on that most fundamental social contract, we should not be surprised if the middle class loses faith in democracy itself. Tax policy is not only or chiefly the province of accountants or economists. It belongs to all of us because it is how we decide what kind of a country we want to live in and what kind of a country we want to build. Today, our government is making our choice. This is the path we must follow, Mr. Speaker. This is our plan to renew the promise of Canada. There are some in this chamber, particularly across the aisle, who do not share our vision. They would cut programs that we have put in place to improve the lives of all Canadians. Nevertheless, our government, in their opinion, should just do a little and then less and ultimately, in their view, do as little as possible or even nothing at all.
they ripped up early learning and childcare. And as housing minister, the current leader of the opposition only got a handful of homes constructed. It was our prime minister, not a conservative, who actually got a pipeline built. And you know why that is, Mr. Speaker? That is because our government understands that to do big things in Canada, sometimes the government needs to lead the charge, whether it is getting more homes built faster or finally creating a national system of early learning and childcare or bending the curve on emissions. Let's be honest about what austerity and shrinking the state would mean for Canadians. It means you're on your own. It means no one will give you a hand when you falter and that you are choosing to turn your back on the friend or neighbour who has not been as lucky as you. That is not the Canadian way. In this country, we take care of each other. Mr. Speaker, to make a positive difference in people's lives, to get big things built, to get big things done, you need more than a slogan, more than a rhyme or two. You can't hop on pop your way to a better country. To make a difference in people's lives, you need a plan. Canada needs action, not indifference. We are acting. The times call for building up our country, not sitting on the sidelines. We are building. Today, we say to our younger generation and to those who care about them, we are putting all the power of government to work for you. We will build more homes. We will make life cost less. We will grow our economy in a way that works for everyone. Together, we will unlock the door to the middle class for more Canadians and renew the promise of our great country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. How do you like them apples? Pretty good apples, if you ask me. That's how you end a speech. Yeah. Well, I mean, the way she went on, what kind of country do you want? Do you want one where we don't give a shit about anybody but ourselves? Was effectively what she said. Mm -hmm. I re I just summed it up really quickly there. No, yep. I don't want no. that kind of country. I think Neither most do Canadians don't want that kind of country. We're a fair play country. No, we don't want that. So, and you will uh, notice, um, I, even though the camera didn't pan, when she said, in this country, we take care of each other, you could tell by the applause that um, there wasn't 338 people who applauded that yeah. line. Of course not. Yeah. I wonder who didn't. It's a mystery. Will we ever find out? Bootstrap yourself. Bootstrap. <laughs> All right. Get some cubs. We have a show. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Crowder Media Network. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember, sharing is caring. Word of mouth is priceless, so please tell your peeps and poops all about us. If you do not want to miss an episode, you don't have to, thanks to the Ray Girl, because if you scan that QR code right under my chin, that will bring you to our pod page. If you're listening, podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters, with a hyphen between each one of those words. And when you click subscribe there, when we have something for you, Fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to your inbox. And By the way, like, yes. all of our videos are there as well. All yes. Of our YouTube shows are also on the pod page for those yes, who are not aware. Yes. And uh, yeah, you, you usually will, uh, most of the things are on the live page. Sometimes there's one or two other things on the video page, but mostly it's all on the live page. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, the things that we do, like the podcast and stuff that are not available via, via podcasts, are also on uh, that live page. Um, make like Kit Elaine if you go there and smash our buttons. Like, share, subscribe, 
hey, we're getting closer to the 750, so uh, please help us, and then to the 1,000. And if you'd like to help us in other ways, because you like the shows that we do, you like the content, you like how we boil things down for you, or we do uh, we summarize things or do synthesis and uh, an analysis, then please, please, please scan that QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head, and uh, that will bring you to our coffee page. That's coffee, ko-fi.com slash eagerbeaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And that's where you can find our tip jar, or we like, like to call it the emergency hydration fund, where uh, you can offer us a cup of coffee or a Guinness or a hot chocolate if you'd like to encourage us to do more. Thank you so very much. Uh, because democracy is something that you do, please do write those letters. And remember, if you live in Alberta, you have until the 22nd to register to be able to vote in the provincial uh, leadership race for the NDP. So please do that. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying, uh, it's been a tough world out there. It is. So please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Uh, tomorrow we'll have more on the budget with uh, some response from uh, the, uh, the opposition MPs and all that kind of stuff stuff and uh talking uh to you know uh polishing off a couple of other details that i didn't have the full information for you today mr grizzly do you have some words of wisdom for us i do okay for those of you who think this will uh this budget will be harmful to you well then obviously you're filthy fucking rich <laughs> so settle the fuck down you know who you are. It's going to hurt you? No. You're going to be fine. It's going to improve my life. I won't have to skip meals anymore or ever again. That's what it boils down to. My life will improve. I might actually be able to join the middle class someday instead of being an, an impoverished working class stiff who is basically facing working till I die. My last job will be to dig my own grave, except I'm going for cremation. So my last job will be to build the cardboard box that I climb into before you incinerate me. That's the future I'm facing. So this budget is going to help make sure that I don't have to face that future. So shut your fucking pie hole whoa, 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 if whoa. you don't like the fact that you're going to pay a little bit more. It's time for you to pay your goddamn fair share. Sorry, fired up. Boom. Fired up. Damn. Woo. Some heat. Mr. Grizzly, please. Cue that cock. Woo. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph something for our opening and closing sequence music. All right, Mr. Grizzly, I don't know Easter egg. Just this one. Lola hunting. Squirrel. Oh my god. Oh my squirrel hunting. Oh, Lola. I wish I yeah, I wish I could find it. Somebody, when you pro showed that one of Lola uh, playing in the park with the dogs, somebody, there was mm -hmm. one of our, our listeners that had a dog that was jumping up at the screen to try and uh, play with Lola. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, the, the, yes. Uh, I wish I could. Great. Yes, hopefully I can find it. If you're, if you're watching, please send it to us again. All right? Have Thanks. a beaverific day, yeah, everyone. Yeah. See you later. Bye.